Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone to the final of our Tiger in STEM webinar series. Um, just to introduce you to our um, chair, uh, it'll be Professor Rachel Oliver from the Cambridge University. Um, over to you, Rachel. Works best, Izzy, if I remember to unmute myself, I've just realised. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here chairing this final session of the Tiger in STEM summer webinar series. Um, Clara, could I have the welcome slides up, please? As you may have realized, we're having a few problems with subtitling today, um, which, which, which we really do apologize. Are they up? Um, so can I have, move it to the next slide and I will tell you. Are you seeing anything? Um, I am on Zoom. Ah, and now I am on YouTube as well. Fantastic. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Rachel Oliver, and I will be chairing today's webinar, and I am indeed delighted to be doing so, as I was just saying. If I could have the next slide, Clara, that would be fantastic. Just to let you know, Rachel, there is a large delay between Zoom and YouTube, so. Okay, well, I'll beware. start then um, while we wait. Ah, there's the slide. So I just want to remind everyone that our webinar is run under our code of conduct. Um, if you would like to view the code of conduct, you can do that by scanning the QR code, which is on the screen at the moment. I'd also like to remind everyone that we would prefer you not to record or take screen grabs of any of the talks we are showing today. We are trying to use PowerPoint to caption the webinar um, as far as possible. That is running very slowly at the moment. So we do apologize to that. And also um, Dr. Kwesi Kwakwa's talk, we haven't been able to sort out subtitling for. So I'd like to reassure everyone that in the recorded version of the webinar we'll put online later, we will try and make sure that those subtitles are present. I can see already that people are doing some chatting in the chat. Um, please do continue to do so. And if you put question for the speakers there, we will um, relay those questions to the speakers for you to generate some discussion. Um, can I have the next slide up, Clara, please? So this entire webinar series across the summer is being run in honor of Dr. Claudia Alexander. Um, now, Dr. Alexander has been a real inspiration to many women in physics and in the sciences more broadly, particularly women in color. Um, her work and her leadership paved the way for many of NASA's missions, including the Galileo mission. Um, she was a black woman who reached the very top of her discipline in physics. She was a teacher, an author, and a really great moral model. And she's left behind this inspiring legacy um, for particularly for women of color working in STEM. So we're really pleased to be celebrating her contributions to science and recognizing um, all of her work with this webinar series. And if anybody would be able to, um, obviously these webinars are free for everyone to view. We hope you're enjoying it. We hope you're getting a lot out of it. But if you could um, make a donation in Claudia's memory to Generating Genius, which is a London-based charity. And in a second, if Clara can give it me, there'll be a slide with a link to Generating Genius. This is a charity helping school children from disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly black and other BAME students to enter university and then to go forward into careers in science. Um, and we're hoping to support them with this webinar series. So the link is on the screen now, um, and we would be delighted if some of you were able to donate. 
Right, I think that's all of the housekeeping for today. So it falls to me now to introduce Divya Persad, who is our very accomplished first speaker. She's not only a planetary scientist, she's also a writer and a composer. Her research spans mission development operations, the surface and interiors of Mercury, Mars, and the icy moons of Saturn, and the meteorites and asteroids they come from. She's currently pursuing her PhD in UCL's Muller Space Science Laboratory, where she's applying 3D imaging to understand the landing site of the Curiosity rover. She's also really passionate about bridging the spheres and bringing together different models of science and scientific engagement. She was awarded the Elizabeth Puknarevitz Award for Outstanding Contribution to Public Outreach in 2018. And she's also the recipient of an Editor's Choice Award from the Great Indian Poetry Collective for her upcoming book and song collection, Do Not Perform This, A Song Cycle. She's been read and published her poetry internationally. She released her first album, They Will Be Free, in 2017, and she's working on her second album in a chamber pop duo. Um, I don't know whether she's going to tell us about music or writing today, but I'm sure she is going to tell us about science. Um, and I'd like to welcome her to give her talk entitled 3D Imaging and Visualization to Investigate Complex Mars Geology. So, Clara, if you could unshare your slides and Divya, if you could share yours, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Rachel, uh, and thank you all for having me. Um, so to start, uh, I'll actually talk a little bit about the background of this slide and very slowly we'll get the context of this. So what you're looking at back here behind the text is uh, a river channel on Mars. And this is an image that I've somewhat processed and visualized in various different ways. Um, but for the most part, you're looking at an ancient riverbed that probably fed into a lake in Mars and eventually dried up. And now Curiosity Rover is slowly climbing up the slope uh, of this lake, of this dry lake bed. Um, and this is the study area of the last sort of third of my PhD and what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, so why do we care about 3D? And this is a really important question because I think a lot of us sort of think that it's self-evident that you know 3D is something that we relate to and it just makes sense. And that's actually kind of the point. Um, so we as geologists on earth uh, study rocks in 3D. So I've shown you two pictures here of people studying outcrops. Um, so an outcrop is just an exposure of rock. And as we go back in time in that rock, um, for example, so if we go deeper into that rock, we're going back in time. and so when we go out into the field, this is what we do. We pick up rocks, we look at them, we rotate them, we feel them. We go up to an outcrop, we look at the size of bits of that rock or grains. Um, we look at the layers in that rock and all of that is done in a very 3D environment. Um, so we as geologists are trained to understand things in 3D, whether it is visually or um, through touch. And that's a really important aspect of how we do our science. Unfortunately, uh, most space data is taken from orbit. So here's an animation on the side showing you what that means. So here's Landsat 8, which is a really important uh, satellite of Earth that goes around the planet and takes strips of images. And this is the type of data that we typically get of planetary bodies in the solar system, of the sun, et cetera. Um, and these images, as you're seeing in that color strip, they're looking down and they're also looking in 2D. And this is radically different from what we would see going up to say a cliff face and touching it or looking at it or perceiving it in some other way in three dimensions. Um, and this changes how scientists understand the surface. We have to be really creative to look at a 2D map covering uh, miles and miles and miles uh, and contextualize it with what we've been trained to understand uh, really up close or even just a few feet away or a few meters away or just maybe a mile wide. Um, and so that's a continuing issue. And we only have so much data from Mars, which is mostly from orbit, actually very little information from the little uh, rovers that we've sent. Uh, and we're trying to answer some of the biggest questions of planetary science with that little bit of information, such as, 
did Mars once host life? So here's an animation of what water may have looked like on Mars. So you see a huge ocean on the Northern hemisphere of Mars. And over time, it, it's drying up and we don't know how long it's it stayed, whether it had some cycles of uh, being widespread, drying up, being widespread, drying up, or if it was just wet and warm for a really long time and then dried out eventually. We just don't know. Um, and so, we have to be really creative with how we get information from the little bit of data that we do have from space. Um, so just to start off on how we get 3D images, which is really fascinating and not trivial at all. Um, and uh, for people who see, we get 3D information uh, basically from a little formula. So our eyes are separated by a little bit of space. And when we look at an object, each eye is getting a slightly different picture of that object. And then our brains are able to process those two images alongside other information that we're getting from our environment, uh, the angle of the sun, our understanding of the physical environment uh, to figure out the 3D structure of something. So if I'm looking at, for example, this glass and I close one eye and then I flip to the other eye, I'm getting slightly different angles, but when I look together, I really get a sense of the 3D structure. So if we want to do this from any other types of images, um, we can do it kind of in the same way. So if we take a left image and a right image, so these are images taken of this river channel from orbit from two different places, and we know the distance between those uh, two, where those two images were taken, we have some other understanding of how the how far away the satellite is from the surface, the lighting conditions, etc. This is the same information that our brains get sort of naturally. And if we give that to computer software, it can derive 3D information from those 2D images and make a 3D model of uh, as a solution of those two images. So essentially 3D processing is just finding a way to do what the brain can do kind of naturally. Um, and some neuroscientists may say, actually, Divya, that's not how it works. And I'm sure it isn't so simple. But, and the computer science side isn't so simple as, as well. But this is one way that we can get 3D information from just two pictures of the surface. And that can give us so much detail. And I'll show you in a second what that means. Actually, now. Um, so this is a crater on Mars that Opportunity Rover explored in about uh, 2006. It's so about a year into its 14 year long mission. Um, and we're looking at a nice 2D map view image. So the satellite looked down at this crater and took a picture and this is the picture. It's actually a bunch of pictures. Um, and so what I've done is I've taken that 2D picture and I've put underneath it a 3D model. So this 3D model again was made from two separate images that were correlated together using complex mathematics, not by myself. Uh, to make a 3D model. And if you drop this in a visualization software, we can actually play around with this terrain. And this is when geologists like me get really, really excited because all of a sudden you see uh, all of this geology comes to life. You're seeing the rims are 3D. You're seeing these dunes on the floor actually become 3D. Um, you're able to measure all sorts of terrain. There's Opportunity Rover looking over this cliff. You can get the relief of that terrain. You can get uh, really important information about the traverse and traversability for a rover. And this is something that we do in preparation for Mars rover uh, missions. Um, so this isn't just limited to Mars. This is a visualization I've done for a potential landing site for humans for the NASA Artemis program in Aristarchus Crater. So this is a 3D model developed my, by my group and I've just done a little flyover here. And again, this is really important where you see this huge contrast of really bumpy stuff and really smooth stuff. And ideally we don't want people to land on the bumpy stuff because they're not gonna get very far. It'll be really diff difficult to say drive or walk somewhere. Um, and this is why 3D ends up being very important for missions as well. Um, and so the focus again uh, is the Curiosity rover landing site for me during my PhD. And this is an overview, just another cool 3D visualization of the rover landing site. So the rover has been traversing slowly up this mountain and is about here this week, or at least about as of late July. And so 
again, these are really high resolution images, but we don't get many of them. So it's really fantastic when we're able to put them into 3D environments and extract every little bit of information we can from them. Um, so as a background, Gale Crater, again, is the rover landing site. Uh, there's so much evidence of water. Uh, there is geochemical evidence. There are clays that tend to form in water conditions. There are all sorts of other minerals that tend to be formed in uh, fresh water conditions over time, typically in warm water environments as well. Um, and that also points to water sitting there for a long time. And so the idea is that most of this crater was a lake, which eventually dried up. But there is some mystery about Gale Crater. Uh, so Curiosity has been exploring, get, gathering all of this evidence of water. And it's been slowly making its way up to figure out what this thing is. And this is called the central mound of Gale Crater. And this is Mount Sharp. And we don't really know how they formed, if they're lake deposits, if they're glacial deposits, if they're volcanic, or if they formed on the impact of Gale Crater. Um, and this is a, a 3D representation of Mount Sharp uh, from my own data. So you can kind of see it's this very, very sharp <laughs> mountain in the middle of Gale Crater. And uh, so it's sort of Curiosity's task to figure out, OK, what is the history of water? And how did Mount Sharp form? And Part of my PhD has also been looking at this problem. And I've been, I've been applying my own 3D models using orbital images to be able to do this. Uh, so here's an example of that data. So on the left, you have a full mosaic of Gale Crater that I've made um, in 2D, but it also has 3D data. And this little box around this lovely uh, shape right here um, show, is shown right here in higher resolution data in 2D and 3D. So this wasn't processed by me. I, I did some secondary processing, but you can see that it looks a lot like a river channel that you might see on Earth um, from orbit. So you see this channel shape. Uh, here's what could have been an island as well. And what's really exciting, again, as a geologist, that maybe not to lay people, but to, to nerds like myself, you see all of these lines in the side of the river channel. And as I mentioned, the further down you go in the rock record, the further back you're going in time. And I'll talk about that in a moment a bit more. So what we're seeing is a time capsule right now of this area. And because the river channel really cuts into the central mound, what we're seeing is the history of how the central mound formed. So if we can see this in a natural 3D environment, for example, of an outcrop that you might see at the beach or that you might see on the side of a road, uh, 3D can actually help us do that. So here's an example of this visualized in 3D, and it's absolutely stunning. Um, so this is a little tour that I built uh, in a visualization software to show you uh, what it really looks like. And it's, it really is amazing. It's a huge, huge data set. Um, you can see all of these layers. A lot of them are actually in 3D. Um, so this is flying over right now, but we're, we're about to fly through, and here we are. So you can see all these layers are actually quite three-dimensional. We're seeing the relationships of these features, this big uh, feature that's coming down the side of the channel and flowing along the side of it, this sort of feature right here as well, interrupting these layers, these maybe repetitions of these sets of layers as well. There's bright, there's dark. Um, there are these ripples on the floor that may be recent or they might be old. And so there's so much information here that you can get in the 2D, you really can't access the relationships of them and the geometries of them until you see them in 3D. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so I'm talking about layers and the study of layers in geology is called stratigraphy. It literally means measuring layers. And uh, so here's the, the general principles of stratigraphy. So generally, again, the further down you go, the older rock is. Uh, rock is usually deposited horizontally. <coughs> and so any change, um, any sort of angles that you see are probably either due to the depositional environment. So for example, if you're getting deposition <clears throat> on a slope, or there's some later process that's disrupting these layers. So some sort of tilting or folding due to tectonics. Um, and then cross-cutting relationships, which means that anything that sort of crosses a bunch of layers happened after the formation of those layers. 
And uh, so stratigraphy, using all these principles, when we look at layers and we look at their relationships and geometry, we can think about how the rock formed and importantly for Mars, did water exist for how long and in what form? Um, so here's a picture that I took at the beach a few weeks ago. Um, so it was a very non-crowded beach, just, just as disclosure, uh, in County Durham. What you're seeing here are some cliff faces and you're seeing all these lines. So this is a, a nice classic outcrop. This is what an outcrop looks like. And of course I took this picture because I was really excited to see, <laughs> to see an outcrop on my day out. Um, and so sometimes, again, you see all these nice horizontal layers, hopefully you can see them on the stream, of mostly sandstones. And then over here, they start to curve around. And uh, so this is pretty exciting. There, there are a lot of things to think about of, okay, so we have very horizontal layers, and then on top we have this folding. This folding seems to be happening more over here than over here. Um, and these are the types of things that we do when we approach uh, layered deposits, and we're trying to figure out how they formed. <clears throat> and here's another example of how, uh, if you see layers change, what it might mean. Um, so in the upper right, you're seeing this deformation, which might happen because of tectonics, so plates or faults moving, and you get these really cool shapes in the layers. Um, so that would be tectonic activity, but the bottom is just wind driven, and you see uh, how the dune is migrating, and that's going to change how the uh, layers are shown in the rock record. You're going to get a lot of angles. Um, and then finally, in the case of a river, you might have a floodplain, or um, as a river deepens. So this is an animation of a river deepening and of a floodplain widening. So, uh, and this is a scientific model. So if we can compare what we observe in the field to scientific models of what happened, we can get a better idea of how things formed. Um, so uh, to do this type of analysis, I looked at this 3D model in a program called Pro3D, which is a, uh, a suite to visualize rover 3D data for the upcoming Rosalind Franklin rover. Um, but I've put orbital data into it, which is a bit of a novel use. Um, because it has all of these geological tools to do measurements and all the sorts of things that we do out in the field, but virtually. And that's really useful. So here is one example of the part of this outcrop that I've looked at. I've been classifying these sets of beds, uh, taking measurements, looking at their geometries, um, looking how thick they are, looking to see if there are repeated sequences. And it's very limited because, so the biggest thing you can see in these images is about 25 centimeters. Right, um, and it's also black and white. So it is very limited in what we can do, but it is a lot better than say looking at it in 2D. <clears throat> and so part of this, again, analysis is looking at these layers, looking how they persist along the channel, looking at the relationships to each other. So here's a nice colorful uh, diagram of what I've been doing, just uh, basically separating out these different potential units of rock. Um, and this is how you can take measurements of things. Uh, it's really useful. So again, this program gives you loads and loads of geometric data uh, for, for basically any line you wanna draw in the program. And then you can also do plane fitting. So something that we do as, uh, as geologists is look at strike and dip, which tells us about the orientation of a rock. So whether it's horizontal or dipping, and if you look at loads and loads of rocks and get their strikes and dips, so their orientations and their orientations relative to each other, we can actually figure out kind of the shape of the rock over an entire region. That tells us a load of information. So here I am fitting different planes to different layers to see if they're all pretty much pointing in the same direction, if they're, um, if, which can tell us information about whether they're deposited similarly or in different environments. Um, and then again, you can compare this to models. So just from those few uh, initial measurements that I did earlier this year, you can compare them to models of how Mount Sharp and the central mound formed. And so all of these layers are pretty horizontal and they're mostly dipping in a certain direction this way. Um, and generally they fit either a lake environment or maybe a fluvial delta, so a river delta environment, or maybe a glacial environment. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. It's pointing to water. It's pointing to history of water or maybe just wind, um, which still needs a bit of work to figure out the difference between them. But this is the type of really interesting sort of virtual outcrop work that we can do uh, 
when we need to try to get lots of information from 2D data in 3D. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to show you is, so as an artist, I'm really, I just love looking at the Mars surface. Um, so here in a different visualization environment, I put a little astronaut who's about six feet two. So I'm pretending I'm much taller than I am. Just looking over the edge of this river channel, which is about 800 meters tall on each side. Um, and what they might see if they were just gazing out over this channel. And this just shows you a, a flyover, a zoom out of, of what they might see. And just how incredibly big this place is um, and how incredibly small uh, and easy, it, how easy it can be to, to feel very small doing this kind of work, which I think is really important. Um, and finally, that's it. Uh, this is an artistic rendition of that scene. So the astronaut is, is over here and I've stimulated the Mars uh, dusk. So what you might see at dusk looking out over this channel and that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. So if you could leave your um, slides up, hopefully mm -hmm. that will contain the captioning at least partially for a sure. moment. That's brilliant. And I think we've got some questions for the audience. If we, I just find them. Oh yeah, loads of questions. Okay. So I don't know if we're going to get through all these, um, but to start with, Claudia would like to say that the images and videos are breathtaking and wondered whether anyone's ever thought about using them in an art exhibition, maybe with audio as well. So you could really get the feeling of what mm. it's like to be inside a Mars crater in a kind of AR way. That would be incredible. And I would, I would love to collaborate with someone doing that or do it. Um, so, so this image that I did was just for like a little art uh, competition at UCL. Um, but yeah, it's been something I've been thinking about. Just, there's so much of this 3D data as well to, to do that with. And I think um, it's such a great way to reach people because again, like 3D is, is how we understand the world. And, and there's so much like looking at this view, there's so much of Earth's terrain you can relate to. And um, so yeah, it would be great. I haven't heard of anyone doing that. I think NASA does a lot of uh, its own visualizations um, uh, in that regard. And I think DLR as well, but I haven't heard of any artists doing that. So uh, hopefully we see that. <laughs> So there's a, and there's a follow up comment that maybe some of these landscapes could be 3D printed as a way of visualizing them, which sounds quite cool. Yes, yeah. So that's something that people are doing. Um, Gale Crater is one of the ones that is actually very often 3D printed uh, using a different data set. Um, and I think there's, I think, I don't know if it's a white paper or an upcoming paper on accessibility in uh, research communication using these 3D models. So giving people uh, a tactile feel of terrain when they can't see it. Um, so I'll see if I can find a link to that paper and share it. But yeah, people are definitely doing that work. It is really incredible. Fantastic. So I'm going to combine the next two questions because I think they, they sort of come together. So Anson Mackey says, this is so cool, especially the reconstruction back through time aspect. Are these analyses accompanied by any spectral analyses to determine the composition of the sediments and rock? And Medina Waynes asked about whether you can get information on the type of rock, which I guess is a similar kind of question. Yeah, definitely. Um, so with rovers, this is a lot more relevant where um, if they take any sort of 3D uh, data, which they can do um, with stereo cameras, uh, they can combine that with with spectral data. So a lot of their a lot of cameras. So for um, any sort of pan cam. So the Rosalind Franklin rover has a pan cam opportunity. Uh, Curiosity have pan cams. These are pan spectral cameras, or sorry, they're panoramic cameras, but they're also multi spectral, which means that they can take images at multiple wavelengths. So if they take a nice 2D or 3D image of an outcrop in visual wavelengths, they can also take it in UV or they can take it in uh, near infrared, etc that can give them a lot of information about mineralogy. Um, for orbital data, we have uh, CRISM, which is, I don't remember what the acronym is right now, um, but it takes pretty high resolution uh, spectral maps of Mars, of the surface of Mars. So for this channel, there's a very thin strip of uh, color data from the camera, um, which gives some information, but then there's also a bunch of CRISM uh, images covering this area as well. 
Um, so that, that can give you a lot of mineralogical information. That's something that I'm kind of doing on the side that I kind of don't have time to do for my thesis, um, but I'm trying to get done. And, and that could tell us a lot about like if there's hydrated mineralogy, um, which means minerals that have sort of water uh, suspended in their um, structures or they can tell us if it's just like volcanic rock. Um, but the thing is, it's, it's not high enough resolution to tell us about like all of these individual layers. Um, they can tell us like broadly, like uh, sets of the layers that we see. Um, so it is important information and it can tell us like generally the types of rocks, if they're like sulfates or uh, if they're basalts, whatever. Um, so yeah, the answer generally is yes. <laughs> So you were talking there about resolution and JB says, I am wondering about the resolution these cool 3D models typically have. Like what is the smallest rock you could resolve? The smallest rock in the very best, which is what we're looking at here, is 25 centimeters. Um, in wow. 2D. In 3D, <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it is. In 3D, it's one meter. Um, okay. So what that means is that the 2D images have higher, like a higher sort of density. Um, so we, if we look at it in 2D, uh, we, we can see maybe around 25 centimeter rocks, but in the 3D, when you do the reconstruction between the two images, you lose a bit of information. Um, and the one meter refers to in all directions, X, Y, and Z. So uh, when you drape the 2D image on the 3D image, um, it's not necessarily like one-to-one, -one. Um, but still one meter is pretty good. I mean, one, one meter boulder is huge. <laughs> <laughs> but that is still a boulder that we can see otherwise and that's still information um yeah yeah so so a couple of questions about the data so izzy says these are amazing reconstructions how big are the data sets and what are the challenges that you face in handling such data and idris is wondering how you get access to the data yeah uh, the, the data is big um so the the nice 25 centimeter resolution images uh which are from the high-rise camera are very limited in scope because they are huge. They are huge for the satellites to transmit. Um, and they are very detailed and they cover a very small area. So they don't really cover that much, but I would say one image would be, uh, if you decompress it, it's about seven gigabytes. Um, so the 3, 3D models are big. <laughs> and, um, but the lower, res the lower high resolution ones can be about, you know, uh, 25 megabytes, um, which isn't bad. And the, the 3D model will be maybe 100 megabytes, which is also not that bad. Um, so the challenges really are like learning how to process the 3D. Um, so with that, that was my entire PhD, learning how to use automated systems to do that because it's very intensive. Um, so, so processing a high rise 3D date, uh, 3D image takes about two weeks and that's using our system, which is very expedited. Um, but then processing some of the lower resolution ones, it might be eight hours. Uh, so mostly it's like time and really like fiddling around with software. Um, and as for data availability, it's all open source. Um, cool. So all NASA data from orbital satellites should be just online. High Rise has a really great website. If you just go, I think it's UA High Rise, H I R I S E dot org. They put all of their data, they put all of the 3D there. You can, I think you can view it in 3D in some places. It's an incredible website. Um, so yeah, if you if you just search like uh, Mars 3D data, NASA, um, usually you can just find these images and just <laughs> spend hours and hours and hours looking at them, which is what I do sometimes. Fantastic. So Michael Sulu asks, if there are any geological events, which could mean that you had like a young rock underneath an old rock to confuse your interpretation. Yes, <laughs> um, I'm not a structural geologist, but there is some like, yes. If you, for example, and it's not just, it's not just uh, structural geology um, and I, my geology friends will write me angry emails after they see this, but um, so for example, if you have like a mountain building event, so you have these mountains forming, um, essentially large scale tectonic stuff happening. So rocks colliding with rocks underground being really folded and deformed. Sometimes you get uh, deformation. So we think about like sort of the, uh, the scope of how much something is deformed. And there are instances when you get an entire sequence that is flipped upside down. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know how you figure that out, but that's something that I learned about. Um, and then you also have, and this, 
this gets a bit tricky where if you have uh, magma under a rock and it spits up into um, a dike or a pluton or something and it can, or a sill, it can, it shoots up through existing rock and it might just solidify like that or it might even fill out um, pre-existing layers and so you get like a shelf of this solidified magma that is younger than the rock deposited above it but it's solidified much later. Um, I think there must be other instances and I just can't think of them right now um, but those are two like two of I think the most interesting ones that are kind of tough to figure out in the field. Thank you. Um, so I've got a couple of technical questions to finish off and these are the last two mm -hmm. we'll do. Um, so Caroline asks, when you extract 3D information from two images, do you also have to account for the slight change in illumination direction between the two images? Yes. Um, so again, this is something that is thankfully automated these days, uh, thanks to a very complex data format called SPICE. Um, so SPICE or SPICE kernels, <laughs> it's another acronym, I don't know what it is. Um, it is information encoded in all planetary and I think generally space data that tells uh, the user exactly when a piece of data was taken, how far away it is from its planet, the geometry, the solar angle, the velocity, the temperature of the instrument, like everything you could possibly want to know or not want to know about what's happening. Um, and a lot of these uh, stereo matching software take that information and calculate 3D using that information. So understanding, again, the orientation of the camera at these two different times, but also understanding um, the, light, the lighting conditions will be different. Um, but another thing is that we have to be careful with the two, two images that we take. So they can't be, uh, they can't have two different illumination um, conditions, or they can't be too far away, or they can't be too close. Um, so that's that's a bit of like a feedback thing of, of seeing what works and what doesn't work for a specific area that you're looking at for terrain because um, in some places it might not even matter as much um, but if you're looking at something with high relief then it absolutely matters the the elimination so some of it is is on us and some of it is thankfully on computers so uh, okay almost a related question then so martin jones asks how good is the coverage of the satellite imagery imagery to get a good pair of images so is there luck involved or does it work for any and all regions that you want it to it is it is luck um <laughs> it depends it it depends on what resolution you're looking at so um if we're looking at so context camera which is a nasa instrument uh flying with high rise so it takes a, con a contextual image for high rise images it has global coverage um, so you're frequently going to get overlap and the overlap might not be great but typically you can find like a good ctx pair of ctx's context camera of of somewhere interesting and when i say somewhere interesting because a lot of say high rise images are targeted over scientific areas of interest whether scientists are requesting that coverage or it is the mission mm -hmm. team so if you're looking at the Curiosity rover uh, site, I'm absolutely spoiled for data because yeah, they want as many images as possible. But if it's somewhere absolutely in the middle of nowhere that no mission is gonna go to, you might struggle. Um, <clears throat> there's also global coverage uh, using other cameras. There's um, DLR has a dedicated stereo camera. So any image it takes is automatically gonna be stereo. Um, which is also like a, a godsend if you're looking at something obscure, it probably has a 3D data set for that. But it's, it's, that's about 12 and a half to 50 or to, even up to 100 meters um, resolution. So your mileage may vary. Um, so there is a bit of luck, but also I, I come from like studying icy moons. So I will never complain about having data because there are about like five images of anything of any like moon of Saturn that you want and that's it forever. Um, so the, yeah, there is a lot of coverage. Cool, thank <clears throat> you so much. I really enjoyed that. There were so many interesting questions that are, uh, yeah, um, really, really great. If you could sh stop sharing your slides now mm -hmm. um, and if Quasi, you could get ready to share your slides now, that would be totally fantastic. And I will briefly introduce Quasi, who is an imaging scientist at the European Bioinformatics Institute. He has an undergraduate physics degree from Oberlin College in Ohio and an MRes and PhD from the physics department at King's College London. 
Um, his postdoctoral experience is largely also from London with the Photonics Group at Imperial College and then at UCL and the London Centre for Nanotechnology. And he's going to talk to us today about an overview of super resolution imaging. Um, so crazy, if you could go ahead and share your slides, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Just apologizing again that we haven't got captioning for this, but we will try and get captions up on the version released on YouTube as soon as possible. Thank you, crazy. Thank you. Uh, thanks, great to go. Uh, yeah, so apologies for the lack of subtitles. It turns out that my version of PowerPoint does not have subtitling available. So uh, something to take up with the people who kind of install PowerPoint on my laptop at some point in the future. But anyway, that aside, uh, my name is Dr. Well, I believe it's Dr. Bart Chrissy uh, I currently work as an imaging scientist, and I'm kind of going to explain. Imaging scientist is kind of the fancy term, the fancy official term we've come up with for a person who does stuff with microscopes. And what I'm going to be talking about is single molecule super resolution microscopy, or the ways in which you advance science by watching blinking spots of light. I read this put science twice. Uh, so to explain what image science actually is, uh, the picture on the left is a nature article that came out in 2017. It was, it was, I enjoyed this because it was one of those things I could finally send to my parents to go, this is what I actually do. Because I generally have the problem of, but, you know, I have a PhD and my parents go, okay, yes, you, you're a scientist. Okay, so what does, what does the job actually involve? I build microscopes. Okay, what does that actually involve? I was like, look, people think this matters. Nature has written an article about this. It's real. You should go take a look at it. Uh, and what do you actually end up doing? So my PhD is in optical physics. And once you've done a once you've done an optical physics degree, you kind of your options are the options in terms of what you can do are kind of limited to um, imaging equipment to look at very big things, so telescopes, or imaging equipment to look at very small things, so microscopes. I went in the small direction and microscope building, it, well, once you end up in that direction, you end up microscope building is kind of this, there are a lot of interesting bits of biology that people are interested in for which there do not exist readily available and easy to operate like tools on the market. So if you would like to be able to, if you still so like you want to perform certain kinds of experiments, you need people who can put the tools together themselves and who understand what's happening. And it ends up being this weirdly in, interdisciplinary co corner of science where you need to understand the physics of what you're doing. You need to understand the electronics that in order to, be able to set up the cell to, to serve and control all of your equipment. You need to be able to understand some of the biology of what you're doing. And you need to be able to have a reasonable computer science background because microscopes generate tons and tons of image data. And you need a way of turning that image data into numbers, which will actually tell you something about what's going on in your images. And so that's what I'm doing. And most of what I actually do involves fluorescence microscopy. So we have a quick one slide introduction to fluorescence microscopy for people who don't do this for a living. Uh, okay, so the image on the left is the first, well, so the first kind of recorded uh, exam kind of discovery of fluorescence. And all that's happening here is you have an you have a light source that is putting it light and almost ultra ultraviolet. This is this glass is full of water, and you can see this gen this kind of violet light as it goes straight through it. And this glass is full of water that has quinine dissolved in it, and quinine is fluorescent. So when your light goes through this fluid, your quinine absorbs the UV light keeps a tiny bit of the energy and re-radiates the rest of it back out again at a slightly longer wavelength, which basically means you go from ultraviolet into blue. So very short wavelength, a slightly less short wavelength. And that, and so there's a whole class of materials which fluoresce. If you, if you excite them with the right wavelength, they will emit light at a slightly shorter wavelength. All fluorescence microscopes work by basically Taking a light source, using it to excite your sample, your sample, uh, your sample emits light. That light travels back through your microscope. You filter out the light for, that used to excite it because you don't need that anymore. And you take the image that is left and you focus it onto a detector 
which in the early days of microscopy would have been a human eye, and nowadays is probably going to be an incredibly sensitive camera of some sort. Uh, now, how do we get things to fluoresce? That's a bit more complicated. Generally, that's the bit where you need both a you need both a tame biologist and a tame chemist. So there's lots of biochemistry that goes into making up fluorophores, and there's lots of biology that goes into coming up with really kind of uh, consistent, reliable ways to attach those fluorophores to the things and the things that you care about. And so most of fluorescence microscopy is taking a biological sample, usually a cell, sometimes an animal, and getting the bits of it that you care about to fluoresce, and then using that to be able to, visual, to visualize what's happening inside, inside your target. A uh, quick example here, this is from a microscope that I was building at my last postdoc, just my left. And what you're looking at is a is the embryo for C. elegans. So it's a model, it's a model organism, little worm that everyone uses. I seem to imagine those, I remember there was a fight about them on the internet a little while ago. We're not going to get into that. But the see if I can back up again. The the, the cell membrane of the, uh, uh, this embryo is tagged with a fluorescent dye. And as they, in over half an hour, as the cells divide, you can watch them uh, in time, uh, split up. And so that, uh, that gives you a good example. Now, the, the bit where I get come in, or at least the bit where my, most of my experience has been, has been what happens when we get to the edges of what you can actually see with light. Now here, so what you start running into, if, if you have really, really good optics, eventually what, what, what defines your resolution limit is what we call the diffraction limit. Uh, now to explain the diffraction limit, if you, start, if you have two infinitely small points that are both emitting light, uh, if, and you're standing far and, and you are standing reasonably far with me, you're looking at them, the size of those spots is going to be determined by the resolution limit of what you're looking at, what you're looking at them with. So it's going to be determined by, if you're using your eyes, the limit, limit of your eyes, you're using a telescope, the resolution limit of the telescope. And as those spots start to come closer and closer together, there's going to come a point at which you're not seeing two separate spots anymore. You are seeing one spot. Uh, that limit was worked out uh, about half a century ago by a physicist called Ernst Abbey. And it is now inscribed on a piece of rock that sits in the University of Jena, which is where he taught up until he passed away. And so D uh, tells you what your diffraction limit is. Lambda is the wavelength of light so that you are that you are imaging with, and N is your, the refractive index of what you're imaging through, and alpha is the is the half angle at which you're imaging things. So. If I'm looking at a spot that's over here and I have an ap aperture that's that big, the angle between the spot and the edges of the aperture is, uh, well, the spot, the center and one edge of the aperture will give you alpha. So it, with these numbers, you can start to get a quick feel for what your diffraction limit is going to look like if you're using light. So visible light, the shortest wavelength which we can see is somewhere in the early 400 nanometer range. Uh, if, you, if you're imaging through air, your N is going to be one. If you're imaging through water, your N is going to be 1.3. If you're imaging through slightly more refractive, you can get up to refractive index about 1.4-ish. And the largest alpha can get is 90 degrees, where sine 90 is one. So this value is going to be somewhat, a little bit bigger than two. And this value is going to be the... The, so the largest the largest we can get this value is a little bit bigger than two, and the smallest we can get this value is around about 400. So that puts your diffraction limit around about 200 nanometers. So what that means is, if you are trying to look at something that is smaller than 200 nanometers, between two and 300 nanometers, you will not be able to, all you will see is a spot of light that is about two, 300 nanometers in size. Anything smaller than that is just going to be a spot of light that is about your diffraction limit in size. And the reason this matters is because everything up to here, light will allow you to see. So large, large creatures, smallish creatures, individual cells are you know, tens to hundreds of microns in size. So 
really easy to see with light microscopy. Individual bacteria, you're starting to struggle. Mitochondria, you can sort of see anything smaller than that and you can't. But uh, down on this end are viruses, down this end are protein complexes that we care about. There's lots of very interesting biology that happens inside cells at this range that you cannot see with light. Now, the, the obvious solution is going to be, why don't we just use a smaller wavelength? So why don't we go to x-rays or to electrons and that way we can see small, which people do. But the disadvantage, of, oh, it's a traffic. The way, so and those and those are very useful for lots of things. Like there are lots of things, lots of areas where X-ray microscopy, electron microscopy are very much the right way to go about things. But a you have a those microscopes are sub, are substantial costs. Synchrotrons are expensive. Electron microscopes cost millions of dollars and need like massive basements to work in. B in order to put a sample into one of those microscopes, it requires a very, very careful and uh, preparation process. In the case of electron microscopes, you're also sticking a sample into a vacuum usually, or you're freezing it into ice. You are making, you're doing things to your sample that are going to change it substantially, which may or may not be an issue. But light has the nice advantage of it's relatively gentle. You don't have to do anything particularly special to your sample. And so if you can get lower than this with light, you can watch, you can say, watch processes happen in real time in living cells or in as close to real time in living cells as possible. And that affects the kind of what you can, that, that in theory should give you more, it should allow you to see things that you may, that would be kind of, you'd be unable to see if you had to use electrons or, or x-rays. Now, a couple of the, in 2014, a couple of the, these, so this is from the 2014 Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize. It was won by these three men, uh, Stefan Hell, Eric Betzik, and William Murner. They won this for coming up with super resolution fluorescence microscopy, which is sort of what, what, what I do now. Basically, they started to come up with a series of techniques that would allow you to kind of sidestep the diffraction limit and be able to still pull out information uh, from below the diffraction, uh, below the diffraction limit. Uh, off to the side here is Zhao Wei Zhang, who did not win the Nobel that year, but who also did a bunch of work without which the which is, without which the, all this would be impossible. So. She can, she's won a bunch of other prizes, but she did not get the Nobel. Now, what they did, uh, first I'm going to give you a quick intro to Stefan Hell's stuff because it's not really what I'm talking about, but it's still interesting and it's still useful. So Stefan Hell's idea was a kind of microscopy called stead microscopy. And the way stead microscopy works is you take a laser and you focus it down. Uh, quick side note, the diffraction limit works yeah, you know, just as well in reverse. So if you would like to take a, uh, you'd like to take a, a large part of light and focus it down to a spot, you are limit, You are still diffraction limited. You cannot focus. You cannot focus it down to a spot that is smaller than what your diffraction limit would look like. Uh, what Hell came up with was this kind of was a really brilliant idea to take your first laser, laser and make a spot that is that is limited by diffraction limit. And then take a second laser and make a ring that is also limited by diffraction limit, but ha that has a hole in the center that is smaller than the diffraction limits. And so you take your spot, you shine it on your sample, all of the fluorescent material in the in your sample and that is limited by the spot turns on. The ring comes in at a uh, a wavelength that turns off that specific dye. So it turns off anything that is not sitting dead center in this hole. And so the only place in which you are going to get fluorescence is from a hole that is substantially smaller than the fraction limit. And this works. Uh, stead microscope exists. People use them today. They manage to generate super resolution uh, results with them. And you can generate uh, you can generate images where you can knock down the diffraction limit by about a factor of two. So your smallest the smallest thing you can image goes from being roughly about 200 nanometers in size to being roughly about 100 nanometers in size. 
that we are not going to talk about these. I just wanted to mention them, what we have most likely be talking about as another group of super resolution techniques, which all fall under the name single molecule localization imaging. I, the, in terms of actual techniques, so you hear them referred to as palm, storm, D storm, DNA paint. They're all different ways of getting to the exact same place. And how and how they work is fairly simple. Uh, so let's say that this string, this string with lights on it, is a structure inside of a cell that I'm interested in, and each of these lights is a single fluorescent molecule. If I if they all turn on at once, and uh, I'm looking at them so far enough away that a diffraction limit for any one of these lights is roughly about is big enough so it overlaps with the light with the light next to it. If they turn on all at once, all I'm going to see is a single string of light going all the way down. But if I turn them all off and I turn them on individually, I turn on spot number one, I, 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 record, I record the size of the spot, I turn spot number two, I turn spot number three, one by one, all the way down. Every single one of these spots is going to be, definitely one of these is going to be a diffraction of that spot. We can predict what the size and shape of a diffraction of the spot should be, and we can, using reasonable, we can make a reasonable assumption as to where the center of that spot is. So, if we turn on each of these spots individually, or at least we turn them on so that at no point do any of these two spots overlap, we can find the center of every single one of those spots. We can then. If, if we do this sequentially all the way down the line, what you will end up with, instead of seeing a just a bright line all the way down, you will see a series of individual dots in its place. Uh, how big, how well you can find the center of each of those spots is dependent on the size of the, uh, depend on the amount of light that you are getting out of each of those spots and the size of the spot. Oh, my vision here disappeared for some reason. Oh, can you just, so the, th the, the two things that you care about in order to figure out localization uncertainty are the number of photons that are collected from your molecule and the standard deviation of if you fit a Gaussian curve to, the, to your spot of light and you, you calculate the standard deviation of that spot, those two values between them will tell you exactly how, will tell you what your how small you, uh, an area you can estimate the position of your molecule to be in. This usually works out in day-to-day -day practice to be in, on the order of about uh, 20 to 40 nanometers. If you have really, really nice equipment, you have really, really good floor fours, and you've set everything else up really well, maybe 10, but that's pushing it. Most of the time, you're in the 20 to 40 nanometer range. And what this is going to look like in real life, on the left is kind of a simulated series of spots that are totally going to be localized to give you a, and you can see what they give you on, on the right hand side. On the right is an experiment that I performed five years ago, give or take. And what we have is a cell with the, uh, the cytoskeleton, one of the cytoskeletons, uh, one of the molecules that makes up the cytoskeleton has been labeled with a fluorescent dye. And I turn on laser, everything, and the dye immediately starts to blink, uh, molecules immediately start to blink on and off. And as they blink, every single time they blink, I take an image, I take all of the, I find the centers of all of these images, I lay them all on top of each other, I flatten it back down, and that gives me a final super resolution image. You can look me over here. So this has so this kind of technique has been around for at this point possibly about a decade, and it works assuming you can afford a really really uh, a fairly expensive microscope, a bunch of large expense uh, lot of large powerful lasers, a super sensitive camera, and a relatively fast computer, and even then. To create a super resolution image, most of the time what you are doing is you are taking a series of images one after the other. You're lining all of them up, you're squashing them down, that gives you a super resolved image. 
that may, uh, usually you're taking on the order of tens of thousands of images. You're taking each image, let's say, on the order of 10 to 30-ish milliseconds apart. So you're getting something 30 to 100 images a second, and you're taking about 10,000 to 30,000 images to create the super resolution, uh, super resolution, your final super resolution image. The problem here is that is very slow. Uh, nature moves sub substantially faster than that. So in reality, you can't really do this with live cells that are still moving around, processes that are still taking place in real time. It's too slow. Uh, that's one. Number three, you need, for some of these techniques, you need a substantial amount of laser power to make them happen. And lasers do not generate power in a a laser does not generate power in a flat profile. It generates power in a Gaussian. So at the very center of your spot is where there's most power, and towards the edges of your spot, your power, the, there is less power. This creates problems if you're trying to image a fairly large area and you would like everything to look the same what you image. So that creates another problem people are working on. Powerful lasers cost money because it's the nature of the beast. Uh, super sensitive cameras also cost money. And so one of the things you want to be able to do is find ways to either not use as much power or generate the same amount of power for less money. You want ways to image these for without spending, without having to use super expensive, super sensitive cameras. And that all ties into cost. So once technique come into existence and once the basic, uh, the basic technical issues had been solved, like at this point, all of these techniques work reasonably consistently if you have someone who knows what they're doing. The trick has now become how do you get these things, how do you get to the same place faster uh, across, uh, over larger areas while spending less money? And there are a couple of people have a couple of solutions to this. So including the size and quality, moving the size and quality of view to view, this video is. This is from a guy called Kyle Douglas, who is currently in Switzerland. And he's basically making uh, the, the, the one just making this video was just how the how the kind of power profile of your laser affects what's happening. In the very center, everything is blinking very quickly. It is really easy to find individual spots and reconstruct what's happening with your sample. Out towards the edges, that is less of that's less so this is the case. Things are blink, uh, spots are blinking very slowly. It is a lot harder to reconstruct an image. If you do reconstruct that image, it is probably not going to be any, anywhere near the accuracy that you have at the center. So what you want is if you're going to illuminate this entire area, you want it all illuminated at the same intensity so that your spots blink at exactly the same speed. This is a point that these guys that went on to make in even better detail. What they did was they Again, turned on a laser in the area, and then they quantified how fast your spots are blinking. Well, how many frames your spots stay on across your field of view. And again, at the center of where your laser power is at its highest, everything blinks very quickly. At the edges where your laser power is at its lowest, everything blinks very slowly. And then they figured out a way to flatten out the, the, the intensity profile of the laser so that the entire thing was roughly about the same intensity. And now everything blinks at roughly about the same speed, except at the very, very edges. So there's been a reasonable amount of work going into this. The most recent kind of attempt to summarize all of this in one place is uh, comes from uh, the laboratory of Suliana Manley, who is also the person that Kyle works for. And her lab has done a lot of work on trying to make, uh, make this kind of super resolution microscopy work easier across larger fields of view. So it's actually a fun paper and worth reading. Uh, ways around the issues of speed and power. The, so th these are, so uh, all of these techniques here represent ways to attempt to do this with while well, using less power to illuminate your samples and being able to reconstruct super resolution images substantially faster. These three I put together, well, these four really, these two are two separate techniques, but from the same lab. So I just treated them as one. And all what they're attempting to do here, in all these cases, they're working off of the same exact principle, which is that 
if you if you attach a bunch of fluorescent dyes to something, when you when you turn on laser power and you illuminate them, your your molecules don't stay on all the time. They're actually blinking on and off very very rapidly, but on a so on the order of the picosecond scale, where what you're, imag you're imaging substantially faster, you're imaging and you're imaging substantially slower, you're imaging in the order of milliseconds. But if you take a, a series of images of a sample, which even if you don't have your laser turned up so brightly that everything is blinking on and off like, at relatively slow speeds, you will still see slight variations in intensity over time. So they take those slight variations in intensity, they run some kind of statistical models on them, and they are able to extract a higher resolution image. Uh, that's, they all do it in slightly different ways, which is why, well, actually in some cases in substantially different ways, but they're all trying to exploit the exact same physical phenomenon to get it done. And to the degree that they work, they all allow you to get about double the diffract, about half the diffraction limits for substantially less laser power at substantially higher speeds, but for substantially higher computing power. Uh, what I didn't mention on that list is structured illumination microscopy because it kind of, I felt like it deserved its own, uh, its own mention. This is another super resolution microscopy technique. And the way it works is that if you, it works with, it works off a physics principle. So if you take a, if you, take, if you take an object that is really small bit and you overlay a gra grating on top of it, in the direction of the grating, you are able to extract higher and able to extract higher frequency information than you are in any other. And in this case, higher, fre higher frequency information just means at a slightly higher resolution. So what SIM does is it takes your it takes your cell, you light the fluorescently, and then you create you turn your laser into a grating. And you run that grating across your sample, you change direction, you run it across your sample, you change direction, you run it across your sample again. And you take all of the extra, you take all the extra resolution that you've gotten every single time you change the gratings and you combine all that together into one image. And that allows you to get what you see here, where that's your original image and that's your super resolution image that's being produced at the same time. Again, you're able to do this with substantially lower laser power, but it requires substantially higher computing power to make it work. But uh, sim, you know, sim microscopes exist. They are all, and there are fairly kind of robust attempts to make them really, really fast. And in some cases, there's some people who are doing some really nice work with these. You have microscopes that will give you real time sim. So you're super, you're generating it at your higher resolution at the same speed that you would normally see them. Uh, now, uh, the next step again to lower cost, finding ways to do this with equally powerful lasers that cost less money. This was what I did in my last postdoc at Imperial. We took these, which are high powered laser diodes, which are usually used for in entertainment. So if you've ever been in the club where you've seen lasers shining, shining of the ceiling, they use these kinds of high powered laser diodes, which are generally not considered good enough for fluorescence microscopy because they don't, they have the wrong beam profile. But if you are willing to play some, if you want to play some tricks on them, you can generate a you can come up with as much power as you would normally need for, to do super resolution microscopy at a flatter field profile. And this works reasonably as well. I say it works reasonably as well. I got the paper out of it, so it works well enough. And the microscope is also still in use, so it works even it also works. Uh, other ideas, other ideas from people who have tried the same thing. Uh, super resolution microscopy, well. Any form of single molecule microscopy requires super sensitive cameras. And the reason for this is that every single, every single molecule is going to give you anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand photons light before it disappears. Uh, to put that into context, a single candle, at least the SI unit for a candle, uh, if you calculate what that is, if you calculate using the SI for a candle, what a single candle should, about number of photons a single candle should be putting out. Oh, in a second, a single candle puts out a, on the order of like a quadrillion photons. 
Now we're not imaging, we're taking an image every second. We're taking an image about every hundred seconds, but that still puts you in that that is still a substantially larger number of photons that you're getting than you would get off a single molecule. So your camera needs to be you know, roughly about 10 orders of magnitude more sensitive than a camera it needs to be in order to be able to see a able to use a candle as a light source and regular cameras will struggle with that. You can do these, but these are super expensive pieces of kit because it takes a lot of engineering to make them work. But it turns out that we've been making, people have been making cameras for long enough. So now the technology that is in the big, super expensive cameras is starting to trickle down into these small commercial cameras that people use for you know, surveillance and things that they should, and you know, machine vision techniques. And they aren't as good as the super expensive, more expensive versions, but they are just good enough that you can just about make them work if you know what you're doing. And there have been a couple of papers, this is my favorite of them, that have tried to look at using industrial cameras to do single molecule work. There have been another couple of papers on using low cost lasers and building your own platforms to build these cameras. And so there are, pe so there are people now who, in, who claim that you can do this for a, with a microscope that would cost you in the tens of thousands of pounds. That might seem like a lot of money, but a commercial single molecule microscope is probably going to run you half a million pounds. So this is still like a factor of 10 drop in price, which makes them more available to more labs, which means more people get to use them to do interesting biology. And that was the list. So these are all of the ways in which people are finding to try and improve single molecule super resolution microscopy. The technique itself is fairly stable at this point. People are starting to turn out some really nice results in them. And so most of the work, most of what microscope people are thinking about now are ways to make it work better and faster. I would like to thank everyone on this list. So there's, uh, these two, my two PhD supervisors, I did a lot of single molecule imaging work with them. Uh, Paul, the Imperial Photonics Group, where I spent three years basically building storm microscopes and playing with uh, you know, soldering diodes to power supplies, just lots and lots of fun. And my most recent lab where I was taking all of this and using it to do some single particle tracking results, which I didn't talk about here because there's a paper about to come out and I promise not to mention anything on so it launches. And thank you to everyone for the, uh, allowing me to be part of this lecture series. And for everyone else who has given a lecture, these have been lots and lots of fun. Thank you so much, Crazy. That was cool. And there are again lots of questions. We're getting a little bit later in the day, so I may okay. question this down a little bit. Basically, sure. people who are on the organizing committee, I may not ask their questions and I'll just <laughs> <laughs> um, So I'll start with one from our other speaker. So Divya wants to know whether there's overlap between these methods and those used for telescopes for imaging distant objects. Yes, there are. Uh, the I I hate to say this, but the telescope people actually got there first. So astronomers have a lot more experience at trying and looking at a very very noisy image that has some spots in it and trying to decide is that a star or not. And so a lot of super resolution single molecule techniques steal stuff from astronomy. It's always good to have somebody to rob stuff from. Yeah, we've got life easier. Yeah, about um imaging live cells and it says that you mm -hmm. may, you certainly did that live cells can't be imaged using this imaging technique do you yeah. think it's possible to develop a microscope that does this and what factors would need to be taken into consideration uh so well those i mentioned the kind of the other techniques that are available currently for trying to do some uh, super resolution microscopy if you need to measure uh, you need to measure processes that are happening in real time in cells at better than the diffraction limits, those currently are your best options. There are still people who feel like you'll be able to get there with, if you can speed the blinking up enough, you can speed the cameras up enough, you might be able to do this with live cells. I am skeptical. <laughs> your best option is going to be something like SIM or something like SURF. Okay, thank you. Um, so a few more questions here. Uh, Claudia asks, would X-rays or higher frequency light destroy or damage your biological structures? Yes, but usually 
Well, if you if you are using X rays or electrons in the first place, you've already decided that you, you've already decided that you were going to lose the sample. And so, what you really care about is can you extract the information you care about before your sample dies. If you can't, or if you'd rather see this in a live cell or a very, very recently a live cell, then light becomes your best option. It depends on how small an object you want to look at. Um, one here from Medina, um, which says, has super resolution microscopy ever been used in living animals, i.e. in vivo, or is it only restricted to in vitro samples? I am not aware of any in vivo work. I would imagine you could do in vivo sim. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if someone has done in vivo sim. I just can't think of it off the top of my head, but it's the kind of thing that you could do. I imagine that it might be, again, a problem with not being, being able to have things be sort of still enough and stable enough, but I know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and one last one from Caroline. Um, is there a way to do super resolution imaging in two colors? Yes. Uh, you have to be very careful with which dyes you pick, but yes, you can do multicolor super resolution imaging. Okay, so I do have more questions here, but as the day is um, passing on, I think we best stop there. But thank you so much for a fantastic talk, and thank you also to Divya. If you could stop sharing your slides, I'll just put a couple of final things up on the screen. Myself, I hope. Whoops. Okay, so a few more thank yous from me, not just to our fantastic speakers, but also um, to the people in the Tigers team who have been organizing this webinar series. Um, it's been, I've really, really enjoyed it. And I've not been one of the people doing the work at all. I've been one of the people watching and admiring from the sidelines, a great deal of work being done to make this come together. Um, so I want to mention several people. I'm sure I've forgotten somebody, but particularly Izzy, who has been really the person driving this series forward and taking leadership. Clara, who's an absolute guru with the technology. Also a huge amount of help from Caroline, Claudia and Clara and also Catherine Boast. And I think that one of the things that the team set out to do was to prove that you could have a really engaging physics seminar series with really diverse speakers and I'm totally sold on that idea. I've enjoyed every minute of every seminar. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much, everyone who's been involved in setting this up. Um, I'd love to like come and give you all flowers, but that's kind of difficult <laughs> under current circumstances. Here is a virtual bouquet for each of you from me. Um, also, thank you so much to everybody who's come along and listened. Thank you for your engagements and your questions. It's been really brilliant um, and an amazing atmosphere in these online seminars. Much better than I thought could be possible, actually. It's been fantastic. Um, another way you can support us at this time is to fill out our survey, which um, so that you can tell us what you think of this inaugural Tiger in STEM summer webinar series. If you scan the QR code that should be on your screen, it will take you to our survey. And there'll also be a link available through the um, web page, the YouTube web page through which you're watching this. And I expect we'll put it out on Twitter as well. So do tell us what you think. Um, I hope we might be able to do this again sometime. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you very, very much to everybody who's been involved. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, There's a series of thank yous that we want to make, but we will um, take that to, to a Twitter thread. Um, so in the next hour or so, thank you very much to everyone who who's, uh, helped us and joined us through the last five weeks. Um, thank you. Bye-bye.